Hello, everybody, and welcome to The Buck Line with Rob and Adam. My name is Adam Cauley, aluminum of the Second City Main Stage. And my name is Rob Norman, chef of the ultimate bok choy, cooking with only aluminum products. <laughs> and I am excited here to talk about cooking, the kitchen, and what's going on with Asian cuisine. Um, that surprised me. What is that? Bok choy? No, no. What You, you're, you sounded like... Uh, that was something you had to learn for like an audition somewhere. No, I was, you made up a bunch of fake words uh -huh. and then I reincorporated them into my intro. I was improvising. You're a very good but improviser. I've... <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, what's so funny. I don't cook at all. Uh, I'm very bad at it just cause I grew up mm -hmm. no one taught me anyway. So I've taken to um, really, there's a few things that I cook well, and I use that term very lightly, but mm -hmm. uh, I take a lot of pride in it now. And so mm -hmm. I make breakfast in the house mm -hmm. and I'm really, Danny really loves um, egg sandwiches. Mm -hmm. And so like breakfast sandwiches. And so now I'm getting all artisan with them and I mm -hmm. feel such pride and such like delicate nuance in all of this. And I'm like, oh, I, I'm starting to get what chefs like and like what mm -hmm. the feeling is, even though mine is so basic, but mm -hmm. um, I can see into my future of like, oh, I think I will like this eventually. I mean, I, I think people think about cooking as something that is the fancier, the better, but I've had some very fancy food that is horrible. The idea that you've made something simple, you've made something well, is an incredible feat. So an egg sandwich made to perfection is not, no joke, man. Okay, you ready? It's no joke. You ready? Yeah. So English muffin. Yeah, okay. Okay, an organic free-run egg, right? Just okay. a little fry up. You mm -hmm. got, um, you know, you got to butter that, butter that egg McMuffin or that English muffin. Then yeah, okay. you get Irish cheddar. Okay. Some spinach, mm -hmm. some super sada, and then more Irish cheddar, and then a little hot sauce. Oof. Mm. Oof. We love it. We love it. In, in our home, mm -hmm. English muffin, mm -hmm. red, and I'm, I know you're not into this jam. This is not going to be your jam. Let's see. English muffin, uh -huh. mayo. Okay. Slice of raw red onion, cheddar cheese, egg cooked sunny side, smoked salmon, maybe some capers. If I don't have capers, sometimes I can get away with pickles. Okay, yeah, yeah, that's not up my alley, but um, Whew, it's good though. It's good. Anytime onions involved, no thanks. I could uh, tell. I could tell the minute I said onions, you were out. You yeah. were out instantly. But yeah. this is why this is why you and I are improv partners, because if you mm. tour together, if you sleep in the same bed often, we have to share meals. We have to get to know the likes and dislikes of our partner. Oh, don't talk about. No, 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 no. Don't talk about that. Um, Rob. So we got an improv podcast. Uh, you and I teach a lot together, but we also teach a bunch apart. Mm hmm. Uh, and it's really funny because like since the pandemic, we haven't. We've just started over the last few months teaching together again, um, going back on the road. And whenever we come together and we split a class, like we we teach the same class together, which is a very weird thing. But you get to see how each other teaches. And it's very fun to watch like, oh, that's how Rob phrases that thing. And mm -hmm. sometimes it's like, oh, I'll steal that. And sometimes it's like, I don't understand what the hell he's talking about. And then we can talk about it later in bed. But the the fun thing is seeing how each other's brains work. Because we do shows, but we're not looking at each other being like, ooh, Rob's doing this technique right now. So when we're teaching, it's like, oh, that's what Rob's brain is thinking uh, in a lot of these moments. Or that's what he values uh, in an improv class, thinks that's what should be imparted to students. So we were talking a little bit about something you're dealing with in class right now, kind of you're exploring. And I was like, Rob, what the hell are you talking about? So I thought, 
we have this platform. This is the place to talk about this. So, mm-hmm. Rob, this is what I want to talk about. I want to talk about energy, right? There's a lot of, we're not talking caloric energy. Not talking about kilojoules. Yeah. We're not talking about kilojoules, but we're talking about energy in an improv scene. And I think this is a term that can be thrown around in class that can be frustrating because it's like, ooh, could have used more energy. What, 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 do, you, what do you mean? Oh, mm-hmm. yeah, we were, we're a little low today, folks. Mm-hmm. Okay, do, should everything be louder and faster? What are you talking about? Mm-hmm. But this is something you're really focusing on, so I thought we could break it down today. So, Rob, energy. What are we talking about when someone talks about the energy of an improv scene? You know, I think energy is a very loaded term, and I don't think it's actually a great description of what we're trying to talk about. Uh, Mick, <laughs> Mick Napier, who you and I both admire quite a bit, he has a whole chapter on energy of a scene. And he's a quite, quite a scientific-minded fella. But in that chapter, when we're talking about the physics of improv, he describes, like, the light coming off of a... Um, a Fresnel hitting an actor is adding energy to the scene, but uh, that is a scientific approach and has nothing to do with how we perform on stage. Unless you're a plant, light hitting you does not give you energy. Um, it gives you light. That's all, the only thing it does. When we're talking about the energy of a scene, what we're talking really about is the drive and the focus of the scene. And scenes that have lots of energy have lots of drive, focus, and maybe I'd also add impulse to it. They feel um, free and powerful and intentional. And scenes without energy that are lacking energy, they feel sluggish, they feel confused, they feel purposeless. So, I mean, you could you could sub in the word energy for impulse, you could sub in the word energy for focus, but because I inherited this term energy, I'm going to go with energy. Okay. So someone says to you, uh, Rob, you just did a scene. Um, great energy. What are you taking that as? What do you think they're referring to in general? I think that my style of play uh, was very watchable. It was very specific. Um, I kind of knew the direction that I wanted to head in the scene or the scene itself had a direction where it was headed somewhere you know in a great improv scene we can kind of feel like a roller coaster climbing up its path you know if you've ever been on like the leviathan or the behemoth you're kind of clicking up you hear that tick 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 mm-hmm. tick, tick 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 of the roller coaster and you can feel this kind of kinetic energy building up and you're just kind of waiting for it to drop um, that's also happening in an improv scene Except each of those ticks are, are laughs. Oh, big laugh, bigger laugh, bigger laugh. It's the pattern of the scene. It's the story, whatever, you, however you want to describe it. You're going to get to a point where the energy is at the highest point it can possibly be. And then all of a sudden it's going to drop out and the scene's going to change. And that transformation is going to be the end of the scene. Uh, uh, so to me, I go, oh, I did my job correctly. I created a kind of track that I guided the audience up and we got to a point that uh, we all agreed this was the most interesting, exciting part of the experience between me and my scene partner. And then in that moment, it changes and we move on to something else. Okay, so I'm a student in your class. And, and you are. I'll see you on Monday. <laughs> um, I hear what you just said. I say, okay. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All right, time to do a scene. Um. I'm going to I'm going to enter faster. No. And uh, I'm going to I'm going to shout at my partner. No. And then shout at the audience and that will meet a good scene cuz Rob said energy. No. So, tell me then, how do I uh how do I take this and how do I apply it? Great question. Yes, I hate this term energy. I hate it because exact, it's exactly what you just said. I'm going to yell louder and I'm going to be bigger. And it's not that at all. That's not what I'm talking about at all. This is a very bad term. I would love someone else to rewrite the term so we can have a different meaning. Anyways, um, when I'm talking about energy, I'm not looking for wild energy shouted out into the ether. I'm looking for a specific term, which I've created, which is called direct energy. 
And direct energy is a kind of intention that's being shot at my scene partner. Um, so for example, let's say I am happy. At the beginning of the scene, I'm happy. I have a big smile on my face and I go, Kalu Kale, it's a sunny day here in Sunnyside. Hooray, huzzah. Well, that's indirect energy. It's going out to the audience, it's going out to the environment, but it doesn't do anything. It doesn't do anything in the scene because it doesn't transform you. However, if I look at you at the beginning of the scene and I'm just feeling so much happiness and I go, darty eyes, you got the darty eyes, Adam. You keep looking back and forth on your screen. Your eyes are darting. Yeah. That is a kind of direct energy because it's pointed at my partner. And when I put energy into you, I cause a change. And that change is very important because it's actually the next offer of the scene. You know, when I comment on you or when I'm affecting you and you change because I put energy into our dynamic, that allows me to put my energy to the new change in the scene. So um, there's a lot of, um, you know, a lot of different ways to initiate a scene. Um, and I think the majority of people believe that initiations are, you know, uh, a good indicator of how the scene's going to go, right? Those first kind of 30 seconds, um, you're really setting yourself up either for success or for some trouble. Um, there are a lot of ways to initiate and so many options seem like it's indirect energy. It seems mm -hmm. like I'm going out and I'm chopping carrots. And I'm, mm -hmm. I'm doing that facing the audience. I don't even know what my scene partner's doing. Some people think these blind initiations um, where I'm purposefully turned away from my partner because I don't want to know. I want to be surprised. All of these seem to be indirect. What do you think about those as options? I feel like when we're creating indirect offers they're fine it's not like the scene falls apart when you make an indirect offer but actually i'm gonna do something i don't like to do which is to quote you ew i know it doesn't feel good but one of the things that you have said is you're gonna have to choose to feel something sometime you're gonna have to choose to affect your scene partner sometime so you can do it 10 minutes into your scene when you've already lost the audience or you can do it right from the beginning if I could think about a direct offer or an indirect offer, pointing my offer at you to expect and hope for a change in you, a change that we know as Game of the Scene players that that change will never come, is always going to be more evocative and more intimate than making an indirect offer. Because the basis of an indirect offer and the appeal of an indirect offer is it's inherently polite. So when I say beautiful day out here in Sunnyside, it's not, it's not offensive to my scene partner. It doesn't rile them up. It's what I would say to my neighbor leaving mm. my house. It's the kind of thing that you say where you're like, I'm making a gesture to create a kind of companionship, a kind of infinity with you, and I'm saying these benign things that no one could possibly get offended at. But in improv, why would you ever want to be polite? What's the value in politeness? Unless you're doing some kind of satirical bent on like a Stepford Wives, American Psycho, look how fucked, it, fucked up it is that I'm so polite to you. I'm so disconnected from reality. I, I feel like being direct is always going to yield the best results. It's funny. It's, um, I always try and you know create parallels to real life situations. And I think the indirect versus direct in, in creating that change or looking for change in your partner. It's like the indirect offer is you and your pal or your partner, you're going out to dinner. And the indirect is, hmm, sure I am hungry. It's like, mm -hmm. uh-huh, yeah, yeah, it's around mm -hmm. that time. Um, mm -hmm. We gotta figure out a place to go. Ooh, mm -hmm. I love restaurants. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. But saying, "Oh, tonight I'd like to go to Christina's around eight p.m. 
and I want to have the Saganaki and the stuffed chicken. It's like, whoa, you've made a big choice that affects your partner. You've made some sort of um, potential for change in them because they have to react to that. That's Mm -hmm. something that is going to lead to the next choice rather than, sure, I'm hungry. Your partner's like, "Uh uh-huh. Okay. Mm -hmm. What? So it's very interesting to see when these choices work well in an improv scene they also typically work well in any moment of a relationship, right? They move the thing forward rather than being this passive, maybe you can do something and then I'll react, but I don't want to be the one to cause you to react. Well, and I also think this has a lot to do with our kind of trauma of how we're taught to improvise, which is the reason why you cut carrots at the beginning of a scene is because at one point in your career, you were on stage for so long that no one edited and you got stuck out there and you felt really embarrassed and you felt really bad and you didn't know what to say and you didn't know what to do. And you made a promise to yourself that you were never going to look like that again. So the offers that you make, you can sustain indefinitely. And you kind of go into a trance-like state when you're chopping carrots. I'm chopping the same carrot over and over and over again. I'm watching a 10-minute scene. I'm like, how, how thinly sliced are these carrots? You've been chopping for 10 minutes. It's a puree by now. I don't know what's going on. Well, the reason why you're doing that is because it's not going to change. You're not going to run out of carrots to chop. But that's a really bad strategy to make an improv scene because you're creating a kind of static scene that that is designed not to change. You're just treading water. You're not living. You're not existing. As opposed to, instead of performing to the fourth wall, look at your partner and Find something about them that you can play. And I would recommend picking an emotion, putting that emotion at your partner, and then seeing what it does to them. And and this is a a big piece about improv. I'm talking about, I'm teaching a a new class other than improv too. It's it's called Mono Scenes. Um, But in, in this assembly class that I'm teaching, I've started to use the term losers to describe 90% of improv characters because the improv characters that are created, they themselves don't believe that they can cause change in the world. Like when they're going to say, I love you, they're like fumbling their words and you can just see in the character's face and in the actor's face that they're going to be rejected. So before they've told their partner that they love them, They've already decided that the, their partner, their scene partner, is going to reject them. They've already lost in the scene. These characters aren't existing in a place where they're like sticking around to actually see what happened. Or if I'm trying to tim- intimidate you, Adam, I do my move. First of all, I have to think of the move. I think of the move. I do the move. And then the final part of the move is to stick around on your face and see, did I get you? And if I'm not sticking around to see if I gotcha, then how do I know what my next move is? Well, this is where it's like, oh, it's not two individuals um, who happen to just be sharing a stage doing their own scene, right? This is a rally. We got to, I'm I'm seeing if you're going to hit it back because where you hit this fucking tennis ball, that's going to change where I have to move and how fast Mm -hmm. I have to get there. Mm -hmm. So... I want to ask you one more thing before we take a break here. If you're recommending this to students, if you're saying this is a powerful the initiation is powerful, but it's also going to um, spark something right away. Do you think this changes based on the show you are doing and the length of scene you are stepping into? I'm stepping into a two minute scene because I know that's the pace of this show. It's a montage and we all get edited after about two minutes, or this is a 25 minute mono scene. Um, Does that change the recommendation in your mind? I think with all things I teach, the thing I'm interested about in improv or teaching scene work in improv is I'm interested in the core of what makes a scene work or not work for that matter. 
And when I find something like direct energy, yeah, I, I could hear someone say, hey, I'm doing a 20-minute scene looking at you in the first line being like, Adam, fuck you, is a very intense, very intimate move to make off the top of a scene. What are we going to do for 20 minutes when I'm being that aggressive with you? But I would say there is a way to play that energy. You may not choose to go direct right away in a scene like that, but eventually if I'm thinking about a successful scene, there will be a moment where you have to use that direct energy. And I actually think it's much harder to shift from being indirect to direct with your partner because once we start in a kind of indirect, oh my gosh, it's sunny outside, it's hard to go from polite to intimate. It's, it's easy. It's easy to go to intimate to polite, to take a break from how intense you're being. It's much harder to start feeling something when you're already kind of stuck in this groove of not feeling, not being intimate, not being present, not being affected by your partner. So I would say for the most part, um, it's better to start direct than indirect. Um, and I would say even if you're not, even if you're not going to start in a direct way, you have to be prepared at one point to make this a direct scene. You, you must affect and be affected by your partner. There is there is no other way out of this improv scene that ends successfully if you're not affecting and being affected. Rob, when you first talked about this um, this idea, I was like, isn't this like the Ontario Hydro Company? Like, isn't that their actual name is Direct Energy? I have no idea. All right, just a little sidebar. Now, yeah. um, you had talked a bit about indirect energy. Mm -hmm. and kind of associated that with invention mm -hmm. and direct energy is more about discovery right and those are two kind of key differences invention and discovery within an improv scene can you talk a bit about that so invention is where i create information it's not based on what we're doing together i just go into my brain and i make something up so you know a lot of initiations are invention based well here we are in the basement you the mother and i your stepson and i have to clean all of these dishes by five o'clock otherwise when my dad gets home he'll be really mad Ooh, that sounds like a well, juicy scene um you are welcome to play that scene <laughs> i will be at the bar um it it may seem like that's a great initiation but it's not based on what you're doing i basically just made something up in my head and then kind of just spat it out at you. Discovery comes from a place of you having an emotional state, I having an emotional state. We're playing our dynamic. And as we play our dynamic, we discover information about the scene. So for example, if I feel guilty and you are angry and we're playing this scene, that behavior repeated over and over and over again, you and I might both arrive to the same plot point, which is we're romantic partners, I've cheated on you, and now we're trying to see if our relationship can make it. <laughs> that would be a moment of discovery, and that didn't come from my brain, it didn't come from your brain. You picked an emotion, I picked an emotion, and the combination of those two emotions created a scenario in which we it felt natural to assume that this was the reality that we were living in. So that would be an example of discovery. We could see that if I'm playing in an indirect way, which means my energy is out to the audience, it's to the fourth wall, I'm saying an opening line, I can't imagine in a way, in any way, that that indirect energy is going to yield some kind of discovery. Because it's not at your partner, you're not being affected by your partner, you're not affecting your partner. However, if I turn my initiation away from the fourth wall, and I would recommend everyone, if you're not doing this in your shows right now, I would recommend at least trying it in rehearsals tonight, which is instead of putting your offer to the fourth wall, turn it, look at your partner, and say the first line to them. It's such a valuable tool. And it kind of uh, like doesn't change anything. Like it doesn't change if you're like, lovely day today and you're saying that to the fourth wall versus you saying it to your partner well now you've got you've got someone accepting it or at least taking it in mm -hmm. but you it's not like you had to create brand new exciting initiations you literally just changed where you were putting the energy 
either to a vacuum or to the like it's like it's like if the people on TV were desperate to get us watching TV more interested. So they looked to us more and more and like, huh? Mm -hmm. How about you in the crowd? Mm -hmm. You sitting on your mm -hmm. couch. But it's like, no, mm -hmm. they trust that what they're doing with the people who are in the scene with them, that's the engaging part that's going to draw us in. Not us fishing for them to come closer to us. Allow the scene and the things that are happening between you and your partner be engaging enough that they come forward rather than kind of, yeah, tossing a line out there and trying to reel them in. Yeah, I mean instead of performing to the audience, perform with your scene partner, I think is pretty good advice. But I think that that's a really good example. So if I say, um, a beautiful day out today to the fourth wall, you're not affected. But if I look at you, and if we're doing the scene right now, I go, hey, Adam, beautiful day out today. So I've said beautiful day today, and I've noticed that you did not smile back. You didn't agree with me. You're quite withholding. And so for me as an improviser, I'm going, hmm, I tried to wish him a good day. He did not respond the way I wanted him to. So I need to figure out a different way to do it. Uh, bonjour. Hmm? Bonjour. And in my Bel mind. Bonjour. <laughs> what? <laughs> and in my mind, as I'm watching this, right? Like, part mm -hmm. of the thing, like, if you say that line to the fourth wall, sometimes I don't even know if I'm in the scene. Yeah. Right? Especially off the top, I'm like, should I enter? Am I in this world? Like, I'm starting off being questioning of you. I'm starting off not being confident. I'm not mm -hmm. offering you any help because I'm like, I don't even know what to do right now. Should I walk in? Mm -hmm. um, but you just now doing our our um, initiation example. Excellent scene. Excellent What's scene, ahead? By the way. Perfect scene. A good day scene. Honestly, good. perfect scene. Mm -hmm. um, you directing that to me and looking at me in the eye, even though we're over Zoom, it's like my first, I have a physical reaction. And my physical reaction, this one was like, who's this piece of shit? Mm -hmm. Like, why is this dude so positive today? Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, I have information that I can use mm -hmm. and build upon. Mm -hmm. And I didn't have and, to invent it. And those characters are not just existing near each other. They are kind of built for each other. Because my first impulse, and, and the idea of saying beautiful day out today is, is not what I would consider to be the best way to start a scene <laughs> at all. It's very generic. But because I made it direct, you had a visceral reaction to it. And then that hardened my perspective to be like, oh, I got to do this again. This this grumpy Gus doesn't see how beautiful the day is. I'm going to dig in deeper to that, which I can only imagine if I'm pissed off and someone says good day to me and I don't respond and they do it harder. That's just going to piss me off more. I was like, who's this fucking guy who's speaking French now? Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, mm -hmm. you doubling down helps me double down. Mm -hmm. Now... There's this big mystery in our little example here, which is what's going on? Mm. Like, why are these two people interacting with each other? Where are they? Like, what went wrong that Adam is so pissed off? What went right that Rob is so excited? Well, that's the whole mystery of the scene. That's the whole joy of the roller coaster ride. As we, like, engage in these behaviors over and over and over again... It's going to kind of flesh out the reality. It's going to flesh out the story. But we didn't invent that. I'm not coming to you and being like, I just won the lottery. Like, we're going to be talking. And as we're talking, you're going to say something like, well, you know, it's, it's lonely at night. So it's not a good night. It's lonely at night. And I'm going to go, oh, well, you know, me and Janine are very happy together. I'm not lonely. And then we figured it out. I'm like, I'm dating your ex-wife, and you fucking hate my guts. And you and speak French. And I speak French fluently because I spoke three French words and stuttered the entire time. But, but in that moment, what a joy for you and I to both discover, oh, this is what the whole fucking thing was about. 
oh, that makes so much sense to us. That's so exciting. It is not exciting for me to tell you who you are, where you are, and what's happening. Maybe if I was in level B, that would be exciting. I can't believe I'm improvising. But at an advanced level, or in front of an audience, or from the audience's perspective, no one cares. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> the The amount of energy spent on inventing an initiation before someone enters mm. is a major reason why someone will not enter. I didn't have anything. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't have a good who, what, where. Mm -hmm. And it's like, oh my God, what a burden to have to carry into an improv scene and to sit there on the back line being like, I just don't have it today. I don't, I don't have a, like Jen over there had a great welcome to Sears. Here we are in the belt section. I hope I can buy you a belt, Mr. President. It's like, fuck, I don't, I can't come up with something like that. It's like, well, you, mm -hmm. you don't need to. But there are people, um, you know, who, who feel like they might not want to initiate with direct energy. Why would someone possibly feel like, Ugh, this isn't going to work. I don't like this idea or I'm uncomfortable with this or a teacher saying, don't do it. What might you think from the opposite point of view? Well, I feel like um, if a teacher is telling me not to do it, I would ask, what are you recommending I do instead? That would be my first question. I gave you the Sears example. Oh, okay. And then what happens after the Sears example? I don't know. You then talk I... about belts for half an hour? That would be great. I got to go. <laughs> um, yeah, but I, I understand why these scenes are not only scary, they're a bit hard. They're harder to play and they're easier to play is the feedback I got in a recent workshop, hmm. which was... Figuring out what to do next, you're not worried about it. Because in, in a weird way, I think of it kind of like pool. So I have that white ball, and the white ball is my offer or my energy. I shoot it at you. I scramble you all up, and then I follow my white ball, and then I line up the next shot. The fact that I messed up your little perfect triangle of balls, and now they're scattered, great. I get to move to something else and shoot it again. I'm going to scramble up your balls again, and I'm going to keep doing it and doing it and doing it. Well, that's that's very easy to do. It's almost it's almost too simple to do. The part that's hard about it is, unfortunately, you have this passenger in the scene, and it's you. It's your brain. It's your sensibilities. It's your comfort level. So let's talk about something that would be very difficult to play. Let's imagine I'm smitten with you, and I'm doing direct energy. The behavior that I would be showing to an audience would be the exact same behavior I'd be showing to my partner at home. And it would be direct, intense energy. Well, that might make your brain have little alarm bells go off. Let's say I'm playing fear. It's not fake fear, it's real fear. I'm really scared by each, every move you do. The fact that your eyes just keep darting back and forth. The fact that you're kind of scowling at me right now. Your eyes are just like closing slightly, AC. I go, oh, that means he fucking hates me and he's going to kill me. Hmm. Again, you are very ex you're very exposed in these scenes because there's no great day. Ooh, the forest outside is scary. The imaginary part is scary. No, the thing I'm playing with. The thing that I'm in the scene with is terrifying. That's hard. Yeah, it's um, it does feel like the the risks are higher in that I am I haven't tested the water. I haven't put my toe in. I am just diving in and seeing what you say. And mm -hmm. when we dip our toe in and we slowly get acclimatized to the water, you know, it's definitely not as exciting, definitely not as interesting, but it feels a little more manageable for right now. And I think getting into improv to feel more manageable is not typically why people watch or get into improv. 
And so sometimes, you know, we might need to dip our toe in and see what's up. But there are times, there are options where we can get um, a little down and dirty faster, catch people off guard, catch yourself off guard, and trust that you will make it through. It's funny, I was teaching a class the other day and someone was, was talking about not wanting to enter because they didn't have anything good. And I was like, well, what happens if you didn't have anything good and you went in anyway? And they're like, well, what if it was a bad scene? And I was like, uh-huh. And then what? I'm like, I don't know. I was like, yeah, we'd all forget about it in an hour. Um, every improviser who is improvising has made it through their worst shows, their worst scenes, and they're fine. Everything worked out okay. So it does feel like when we when we look to our improv tool belt, usually we have a tool that we have worked with quite a bit. And this just seems like a tactic that it's like, oh, if this is not something you do, rehearsal, low stakes shows, these are great chances to refine this so that when the time comes and you feel confident with it, you've got it ready to go. Yeah, I mean, even if you don't want to do this in your show, if you don't like this play style, you should have this muscle. I think I think you need this muscle. I think also there's this other piece to it, which is like, you don't want to get caught up in someone's plot trap. So like, could you give me a heavy initiation AC, like a really heavy intro to a scene? Wow, will you look at this greenhouse? I can't believe the end of the world happened and two brothers like us survived and we have to live off the food we grow in this greenhouse. So there's the first obvious option is I get caught up in this. Yeah, well, luckily we have some water and um, I have my rifle so we can kill the zombies. You can see how like my all of my energy, all of my inspiration is being based on the story that you told me in the opening line. Right. And so because I'm engaging with your plot, now you're kind of in control of the scene and we'll probably be battling with what happens in the scene, but we're not actually affected by what's happening. But the direct energy piece allows me to circumvent all of the backstory, all of the background information that isn't playable and really focus on how you're treating me. And if I'm direct, then I'm going to force you to be direct with me. Would you give me that same initiation again? Whoa, will you look at this greenhouse? I can't believe the end of the world happened and us, two brothers, survived and we have to survive off of the things we grow in our greenhouse. You think I'm dumb? Brr? Why are you talking so slow? You think I'm dumb? You think I can't understand if you speak fast? I understand it all. I'm very smart. No, you're... I, I don't think you're dumb. Do you think I'm dumb? No, you're stuttering. What? You're stuttering because you're lying. You think I'm a fucking moron? And you think you should be in charge of the whole fucking compound? Because I'm dumb. I got my rifle. Let's shoot the zombies. Now you're doing a different accent? You think I, I wouldn't know what your accent was in the first part of this conversation? And now? So the idea that I'm I'm tethered to how you're treating me, I don't give a shit what you're talking about. Because it's not playable. The zombies, the greenhouse, the end of the world, it isn't playable. It's just storytelling. The playable part is how we interact with each other. And the fact that, that I'm confronting you about how you're treating me makes you go, what? And now you actually have to play with me. You can't play around me. You can't play near me. You have to deal with me. And building off of that, the audience can see you getting pissed off. Mm -hmm. They can see and, you giving it to me. And they can also see how condescending you are being at the beginning of this scene. Because if if I allow that kind of condescension in the beginning of the scene, and I don't acknowledge it, I'm not affected by it, then the audience goes, huh, oh, I guess in this world that doesn't matter. But if I respond because I'm, I'm legitimately affected by it, the audience is going to go, oh, yeah, Adam was being a piece of shit. I'm kind of with this guy who's angry. Yeah, that, that's something that really did happen. Someone really responded to something. I would behave the exact same way if someone treated me that way. That's a great place for you to start your scene. Well, 
I love it. I think um, this is a great, clear option for people to try out. And let us know how it goes. Um, do you notice a difference in your play? Did you do it without telling your scene partner? And how did they react? Did they like it? Did they hate it? Um, reach out to us. You can always reach us at The Backline Pod on Facebook and Twitter, at The Backline Podcast on Instagram. If you would like us to come to your town, your city, reach out uh, on any of those places and um, we can find a way. Rob and I are heading back on the road and we'll have details about that very soon. Uh, Rob, before we head out, anything cool happening to you on stage, off stage? Is there anything cool happening to me on stage or off stage? Well, you know, recently I, I wrote a, a screenplay. It was my first screenplay I've ever written by myself. It was a feature length screenplay. It was 116 pages, which is quite long. I mean, I did write an improv book, but for some mm -hmm. reason, screenplays seem... Writing the improv book was easy because I was just like, well, I'll just write down what I say in a class. Easy. But writing a screenplay is different. It's also different than improvising because you're like, you're telling a story, which is the same as improvising, but you're telling a story and you're saying it's good enough that you should read it for 116 pages. You should spend 30 minutes with me reading what I wrote because I'm such a great writer. And so that was really, really challenging for me. I ended up finishing it. I took two weeks, which is far too little time to write a screenplay. <laughs> I had a friend being like, uh, hey, I wrote a screenplay. I wrote in two weeks. Will you read it? And he went, I don't want to read a screenplay written in two weeks. I'm very, very sorry. Like maybe you spend two months, three months on it come back and then I'll read it. And I was like, I'm pulling the friend card. I need feedback. Well, I ended up putting this screenplay, which took two weeks to write on this website called The Blacklist, which is like a competition for screenwriters. Uh, and it came back and it, it got a very um, high mark. And oh, people really liked it. And, and now it's, it's trending. It's trending on the front page. How could um, or can people check it out? I mean, you would just go to you could just go to the blacklist if you were a member. If if you ha um, if you log in, I think it's free to join the blacklist. I think if you want to put up a script that you, they charge you, but um, you would just type in my name, Rob Norman, and you would find a nice little screenplay about a bunch of very resourceful Ukrainian orphans um, trying to seize a tank, a Russian tank. So um, yeah, it it was a lot of fun to write, and. Um, I'm glad people are enjoying it. Oh, we love that. You put a lot of direct energy into that script. I and did. Um, to get it done in two weeks and get a great marks on the blacklist. We love this. Hmm. Well, thank you all uh, for listening. As always, this podcast is brought to you by the Sonar Network. If you like the podcast, subscribe, hit that bell, rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. You know, when you do that, other improvisers find us. And I love getting a message from an improviser be like, what? I just learned about you guys. I'm going back to 2014 or whatever and starting. And I'm like, wow, it's been a, been a while, baby. Uh, so do that. Help other improvisers find us. And Rob, we will see you next week. Bye. Bye.